Hello, good afternoon and welcome to everybody, both in person. It's very exciting. We have a whole room full of people, um, which is a first in the last couple of years, isn't it? So you're extremely welcome to everybody that's joining us in person and also to everybody that's joining us online as well. You're also super welcome. And um, it's the brave new world of mixed medium. So, um, yeah, you're very welcome to today's session. Um, so... What's going to happen today is we're, we've got a few things happening. So we're going to hear from our CEO, um, Brian, uh, who's going to talk us through um, some thinking on the pathways of, uh, to decarbonisation. And then we have a fantastic panel. Um, so we have here Nick, for, who's the Chief Executive of Lloyd's Register. We have Domagoy, who um, is a professor at UCL. Uh, we also have Tom Skew, who is part of our team at the, um, in the Maritime Future Technologies team at the MCA. And we also have Tanya Ferry from uh, the London Port Authority. So um, we'll be engaging with the panel shortly, but today is very much an interactive session to discuss um, the systematic approach to the decarbonisation of shipping. So there's a lot happening. Uh, we were reflecting today um, in London Shipping Week about uh, decarbonisation. And this is our attempt at trying to help the sector to start to converge on different solutions. There's so many out there at the moment, and I think there's still a lot of confusion. Um, we're trying to bring the technical perspective, so both from our engineering um, colleagues within the MCA, but also from the sector and things that we're hearing about what we think might be a sensible way forward. Um, it's a hypothesis at the moment, and we're not saying this is the roadmap to decarbonisation. It's not our place to do that, and we don't know enough yet. But we want to start moving forward down a pathway that we think is probably, with the realistic parameters we have in place, the way that is likely to, to move forward. So it, we're not saying this is definitely what's going to happen, but it's just our kind of stab in the dark, really. So, But it, the, the point of today, really, is that it's, it's for all of us. It's the sector as a whole. We have to solve this problem together. Um, it's not on any one organisation's shoulders, but that means it's difficult in terms of responsibility. So we're really keen that... What comes out of today is the sense that we, you know, we're all in acknowledgement the world is on fire. I lived and worked in Africa for the best part of a decade, and I've seen firsthand the devastation that climate change is already having on people's lives around the world. Um, you know, it's, the impact of it now is um, impossible to deny. So, and I know lots of people in this room, lots of people watching, um, are equally as passionate to see solutions start to happen. So we just want to play our part in making that happen today. So you're very, very welcome. We're really glad you're here. And um, yeah, without further ado, I think we'll go to uh, Brian's presentation and he'll just talk us through some initial thoughts. So Brian has a chemical engineering background um, and is very passionate about this issue and has been really inspirational to the team at the MCA about this issue. And um, yeah, he'll talk us through some our initial thoughts about what we think is going to happen. Over to you, Brian. Thanks very much, Saskia, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming along today, and thank you everyone who's uh, joining us online, and especially uh, thanks everyone on the panel. I hope this is going to be a really interesting discussion. So I've got a few slides I'll take us through. Hopefully we won't get too complicated along the way. They're up for discussion, up for debate, as Saskia said. Uh, uh, they're a working hypothesis of ours, um, so looking forward to lively discussion on them. So let's launch in. Um, really got two, uh, two key objectives today. The first is really provoking thinking about uh, what decarbonisation of shipping is going to mean for the maritime sector and the sort of huge amount of change that's going to be required in order to enable that. And I hope that starts to come out in the presentation. And the second objective is to think about how we create advantage for the UK out of all of that change and how we make sure the UK is actually ready to implement the change. So I thought it was just worth reflecting on uh, some of the characteristics of the, uh, the UK maritime uh, uh, sector. Um, and worth just starting, you know, we're just about to take shipping through probably the biggest transition that it's seen since the move from sail to steam 200, 200 odd years ago. And the pace is going to be really for Saskia uh, talked about her time in Africa, you know, another few years of extreme climate events and I think you know we are starting to find to feel a real sense in the in the world's population of urgency around all of this so I think we're as a sector are going to feel more and more pressure to move things forward you know the UK's got a really strong tradition uh, in uh, in shipping 
and uh, still our engineering and regulatory standards are seen as uh, some of the best, a real, a real benchmark in the world. We've got a great uh, legal, insurance, broking, financial services sector uh, in the UK, although that's not, been, that's not been expanding, it's been slowly declining. And I think one of our, one of our thoughts here is this change, this decarbonisation, presents potentially a fantastic opportunity for the UK to reverse all of that. Let's think about shipping more broadly, uh, and this is probably looking at it in the light of uh, other transport uh, uh, modes. It is different, all the transport modes are different, and here's what I think we would see as some of the important um, uh, characteristics of shipping. It's not really there in the public consciousness. Maybe COVID has got it further there, maybe the slightly unfortunate events in the Suez Canal has got it a little bit more in people's consciousness, but it's not, it's not really out there. Um, uh, there are different different bits to shipping, and I think as we've got further into this, it's become clear to us that domestic shipping will probably implement a much wider range of solutions uh, than international shipping, which we think will converge on, on a much smaller number, ultimately, of solutions. It may take a lot of pathways to get there, but we think there will be a relatively small number of uh, final solutions implemented. Really, really important, the safety standards in shipping are uh, inconsistent internationally and on average not as good as we'd want them to be. I think there are sectors in shipping or segments in shipping that uh, operate to very, very high safety standards, but that is not universal uh, in shipping. Uh, we know that the IMO um, uh, uh, sets uh, that sort of baseline of regulation. It does that by international discussion. I keep hearing a lot of criticism of the IMO I actually think the IMO's got a gobsmackingly hard job to do to get that international consensus and uh, uh, you know, it does a very, very necessary role. I think one of the questions we may get onto this on the panel is whether it's IMO that will lead, lead the change or whether it's going to be smaller uh, collaborations of the willing, if you like, that um, uh, start, to, uh, start to really move the change forwards. And uh, standards uh, on board ships are enforced by, uh, by the national flags, uh, whatever flag a ship's registered to. And again, we, know, we all know in the room that different flags uh, uh, set different, uh, different quality of standards. And, and I just put some safety statistics at the side of the slide, just I suppose to illustrate, you know, shipping is still a pretty, pretty difficult sector in terms of number of fatalities per year, just as a benchmark of safety standards. That's running at, what, 20 times uh, occupational, other occupational standards in, in the UK, for example. So other parts of the um, uh, wider maritime context, uh, we all know we talk about shipping being international. That means ships travel freely between countries. You all know this, but it's got, it's got implications later. Large ports often situated in big cities. Uh, the UK is probably a little bit of an outlier, and there's a lot of the ports aren't... Uh, uh, in big cities, but um, you know Southampton obviously is, and there are others. But think of the Singapore's, uh, Rotterdam's, and so on. Those absolutely are connected to big cities. Again, that's important later. We've seen shipping does find it quite tough to change. Um, uh, uh, it's been interesting for me coming into the sector, seeing the pace of change in shipping. It, it is quite slow, and this is a this is a very different scenario for shipping. And. Often, uh, because the margins are tight, uh, shipping governance is kind of opaque, um, uh, complex ownership structures, very international crews, um, sometimes some quite op opaque employment practices. Um, that's all important in terms of access to money, access to institutional investment. Final slide on the, uh, on the characteristics of shipping. Um, uh, some, some sectors, like aviation, are incredibly sensitive to energy density of fuels. Uh, that's a real challenge for aviation. Domestic shipping is largely insensitive to fuel density, so short distances to first approximation doesn't matter so much how much space the fuel takes up. International sh shipping sort of sits between the two extremes. It's nowhere near as sensitive as aviation is, but there has to be a critical mass of energy density in fuels. Um, shipping uses fuel at the moment that 
would be spread on the roads virtually um, uh, if it wasn't used in ships. It's, it's the rubbish that comes off the bottom of distillation columns. Uh, so we use very cheap fuel, quite price sensitive. Um, and different vessels have different requirements. Again, we'll come to this, but uh, the final point, I think something that's really struck me in my short time in shipping, I think, you know, although we've got international standards for training of ship's officers with STCW, they're really not up to today's, today's requirements, certainly not up to the requirements of the future. Uh, and again, that, that's important in the, uh, in the context of uh, uh, changing the fuels we meet, uh, we'll, we'll be using in shipping. So the challenge that we've got, um, uh, IMO is seeking 50% reduction in emissions by 2050. Uh, you'll all have heard the Secretary of State's uh, uh, announcement yesterday, UK ambitions to really uh, push that further uh, uh, to, to zero, uh, zero emissions. Uh, that's significant. Uh, let's see where we go with that. But that's, in terms of thinking, I think that's really important. And domestically, of course, we can set what targets we want, and we've set very, uh, very tight targets. Again, zero uh, net zero emissions by 2050 in the UK. So let's talk about what the options look like. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is not the transition routes. This is destination. Um, uh, I've been sort of reflecting on this, and there's a lot of discussion about fuels being transition fuels. I think it's it's, it's really hard to talk about things that are transition fuels unless you've got some idea of what the destination is. So, you know, if I want to travel to the North Pole, the first steps I take are probably not going to be south. Um, they're probably going to be north. So I wanted really to focus this discussion maybe largely on the, um, the long-term zero carbon solutions. So here's, here's the categories we would, we would lump them into. Uh, biofuels, so that's fuels produced from crops or uh, other biological products. Um, renewable energy, so electricity based essentially, renewable electricity based. Uh, nuclear, so the power sources on board the ship. Um, and the sort of, the, the equation that determines whether those are viable fuels will vary according to whether it's domestic shipping or international shipping. Don't want to go, I nicked this slide from UMass, it's a great slide. Um, uh, so uh, absolutely not MCA work this. But it, it, it's a super slide that shows um, uh, what could be possible in uh, energy saving modifications on board, on board ships. Uh, and looking at this, we might through these measures get something like a 30 to 35 percent cumulative um, uh, gain on fuel efficiency. I think really interesting to reflect that the sector has been quite slow even to implement uh, many of these many of these changes, and I sat through uh, a really interesting discussion with Lloyd's, uh, uh, Lloyd's Register this morning, um, uh, talking about incentivisation, and it, it's clear we do have some more incentivisation to do, just even to get off, get off the ground with these measures. So, just to summarise, uh, some really important characteristics in shipping, I think, that make it different. Very large fuel quantities stored on board ships, so big container ship, 5,000 tonnes of fuel on board. It, let me just expose my background here. So as a baby engineer, uh, in infinite numbers of years ago, I ran um, ammonia storage sites in the UK, 5,000 odd tonnes, uh, which were recognised as major chemical hazard sites in the UK and, and managed as such. Container ship that currently bunkers with 5,000 tonnes of fuel oil would have about 8,000 tonnes of ammonia bunkered on board. So just put context around that. So it's quite significant. That's very different to other transport sectors. Um, we've got this variable, um, variable and not a great bar in terms of the average safety standards of operation. The good operators are really good, but there's a lot of less good, less good operators around the place. Huge sensitivity to price, um, uh, highly international, and ports sit in the middle of big cities. And we think, sorry, we've got four steps on this. There should be three. Um, uh, we think there are three parameters that will um, be critical in deciding what the final fuel choices is. One, the economics and security of fuel supply. Two, management of and the acceptability of safety risk. And the third one, management of byproducts. 
So those feel to us to be really important. So let's talk about the different, um, some of the different fuel options. Um, uh, methanol and LNG. Uh, I think we'd say transition fuels. Um, LNG for obvious reasons. Uh, low 20s percent theoretical reduction in carbon emissions. Chemistry doesn't allow you to take it any further than that, so that's absolute. Uh, step in the right direction, um, but it's limited in what it can achieve. And even to achieve that low 20s percent, there's still some significant um, improvement in engine um, uh, engine utilisation of the LNG uh, uh, required to, to stop methane slip. Um, methanol, interesting, been announcements recently about methanol. Uh, I think we can see how it's potentially a useful transition fuel. Fundamentals are there's a carbon in a methanol molecule. So um, it either emits carbon dioxide or you scrub CO2 out of the ship's exhaust. Well, if you do the sums on the size of pressurised bullet tanks you'd need on board a ship to do that, it doesn't work. Or you suck CO2 out of the air to make the methanol with. Again, do the sums on it. The size of the process kit is beyond, beyond imagination. Um, so I think we would argue very strongly methanol has its place as a transition fuel, but it's not a final solution. Biofuels. Um, really attractive in the sense that they're as energy dense as uh, current fuels and uh, pretty conventional engine technology to burn them. We think though, remember the really, en the really energy density sensitive sector is aviation. Any biofuels available are gonna get gobbled up by aviation. Uh, and that's gonna affect the price of it. And then sit down and do the sums of how much of the world's arable land would have to be given over to supply aviation and shipping and its crazy numbers. So for us, biofuels fails the scalability test. It, that's not to say it won't have some part in transition or some part in domestic, but we don't see it as a scale, large scale international solution. That just doesn't feel practical to us. And that leaves us with four, battery power, hydrogen, ammonia, nuclear. And I think something really fundamental about those, let's, we'll come back to the battery power. Think about the other three, hydrogen, ammonia, nuclear. All three of those change the fundamental nature of shipping that's in our ports. Because any significant event that happens on board those ships has the potential necessarily but has the potential to have a really serious impact for an area of miles square miles around the ship in a sector that is variable in safety standards that has ports in the middle of big cities that's really significant so I, I guess one of the one of the things is we've 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 thought about this is we think the impact of new fuels, whichever of those three in, whatever combination it is, some of the impacts on the way we operate ships, the standards to which we engineer them, the way we regulate ports, the way we think about even national security, applies to all nations, not just the UK, is gonna change quite significantly. New fuels and the fact there is huge quantities on board ships will change our thinking. And certainly for us in the MCA, that's quite, really quite profound. Let's talk then about the, the specifics of the fuels. Um, so hydrogen, um, uh, obviously large quantities on board, you know it's all, you all know it's stored very low temperature as a liquid, just 20 degrees above absolute zero. Um, it's quite a tough substance to handle when you get flange leaks of it and they catch fire, you can't see they've caught fire. Um, but it does, it does float away um, uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine engines uh, or, or big quantities being, engine equipment being in confined spaces with hydrogen. You could see kit being out there in the open air. Um, 
It's one of the most flammable gases there is. Probably acetylene is the only one that's uh, got wider flammable limits. Again, that's really significant. So it's quite tough to store. Uh, and it, I, I think, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things we're feeling is that um, the determinants of this are unlikely to be engine or fuel cell technology. There's, there's some super research work being done on engines and fuel cells, and it feels really likely that engine and fuel cell uh, manufacturers and researchers will find ways to burn, whether it's ammonia, hydrogen, or anything else. There's some really smart stuff going on there. I think our thinking is drawing us to the, the, the fundamental properties of these fuels uh, and how those how those are likely to play out and uh, us having to be quite clear about what is and isn't uh, okay in terms, of, in terms of risk. Ammonia, um, it's, uh, less, it's less energy dense than uh, fuel oils. Uh, again, there'd be large quantities stored on board. It is flammable in air, it's not as flammable, anywhere near as flammable as hydrogen, but it's poisonous at modern, moderate concentrations about 0.2% in the air and you, you, you do keel over and do yourself serious damage. Um, highly soluble. We already know quite a bit about it in the shipping sector. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, people I speak to say, oh my goodness, that's, it's quite tough stuff to handle. And again, I, you know, I have some of the familiarity of that as well. And um, uh, I know the engine manufacturers are having to work through some problems with nitrous, nitrous oxide uh, emissions, and that, that would need to be eliminated. But I think, you know, we've got a different set of hazards and safety issues presented with, uh, with ammonia. Nuclear. Um, there's some interesting technologies being tested out there, molten salt reactors. Um, they're, not, they're not fully scaled up, they're not fully commercialised, there's some big metallurgical issues with them. The dream is of a technology that's inherently stable, easy to control, where the fissile material is so dilute you can't do anything um, really, really unpleasant with it. Um, it does have the advantage, it doesn't require gobsmacking infrastructure. Again, let's go back to hydrogen, requires huge renewable uh, energy generation, about four, four gigawatts of uh, uh, added power generation. Uh, nuclear doesn't need that, but there's a real serious public perception issue uh, uh, about nuclear. And there is a real serious safety concern around nuclear as well. So none of those three options are ideal, and I think we're into the territory of which is the... Which is which is the least unideal, if you like, which is the least worst. Uh, let's just talk quickly about batteries, relatively straightforward. We've done some real life design studies, okay for up to about 200 miles, um, works for domestic shipping, probably end up with some sort of hybrid battery plus something else, bit of hydrogen, don't know, solution, there's options there. But essentially for uh, short range domestic shipping, uh, batteries probably works. It's not an international solution, though. And we talked about disposal of byproducts. Of course, the big, the big question with it on board ships is disposal and recycling of batteries. And there's a whole lot of robotics that need to be developed and put in place for that. So I, I sort of we glimpsed at the beginning the the, the sort of size of system change uh, uh, associated with all of these. Um, they all require different system change. Uh, uh, we think that the international sector will converge uh, on a suite of uh, a, a small suite of long term solutions. Uh, there are market based measures that absolutely need to be put in place to uh, to make that happen. Uh, all of those options other than nuclear require the UK to put in place more energy, more electricity generation capacity. The hydrogen ammonia options require you to make something else with that renewable electricity as well. So there's huge, huge infrastructure requirements. I think if we take the system string things towards conclusions, you know, we, and we're not alone in this in the UK, this is true internationally, 
There is a huge amount of rethinking of port regulation needs to be put in place. These are not things that are routinely handled in ports. Um, uh, uh, Neil's, Neil's at the back from Fleetwood and um, there's a real overhaul of the way that we, we train officers. Um, suddenly it's different technologies, different standards, uh, different leadership capabilities. It's a huge overhaul of uh, office, officer training. Somewhere in that is massive opportunity for the UK. If we can, uh, if we can turn, those, turn those things around and adapt, suddenly our people become properly valued out there in the international sector. So it's an example, I think, of where we can turn this um, uh, decarbonisation imperative into real competitive advantage for the UK. And of course, with offshore wind, wind farms and huge offshore capacity, again, bunkering, even making the fuels, can become a big opportunity. So I think really interesting one. We wouldn't say that, um, uh, we'd say that ammonia and hydrogen front runners at the moment. Um, I think uh, it will be interesting to see whether attitudes change towards nuclear, whether the creation of all the necessary infrastructure for hydrogen and ammonia becomes too overwhelming. Uh, I think we'll certainly want to keep an eye on what's happening with, uh, with nuclear development. Um, uh, and I think it would be quite wrong for me not to, not to be putting it up there as, as one, of the, one of the three sort of potential long-term solutions. So I guess what this, is, this has helped us in the MCA, because I guess we're now quite <coughs> focused on trying to answer um, uh, with all sorts of partners in the outside world in, um, so, some quite fundamental questions. Can we store thousands of tonnes of liquid hydrogen uh, on board ships uh, in a way that passes this neighbourhood safety and security threshold? Can we do that? Same question for ammonia. Can ammonia then be consumed in engines or fuel cells without excessive nitrous oxide emissions? I think we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that later, I suspect. Uh, I guess I feel, it feels to me very likely that that issue will be solved. And where do molten salt reactors on the nuclear side go? How does that technology develop? So for the UK, um, I think, do think there's a real role for the UK to play a lead role in maritime decarbonisation convergence. I think it's really interesting as an agency, we've been quite surprised at how um, willing people are to talk to us, to uh, join with us in um, thinking about this and trying to create a d degree of convergent thinking about what the solutions look like and what we need to do to be ready for them. I think we've got to make the UK system ready to adopt um, new fuels and we want the UK to be a home for early solution adopters. So you heard the announcement about the shipping concierge service yesterday, part of seeking to pull uh, shipping companies into the UK. The UK flag and the work of the MCA very much forward thinking as well as doing the day job very, very professionally. And that's part of how we want to position the flag. Katie was talking about that yesterday. Uh, and we with our partners in DFT uh, really see uh, opportunity for the UK in this. And the UK services, services sector, financial services, legal services, and so on. Somewhere people are gonna have to borrow money. Mark and I were at a, a, a workshop yesterday talking with ministers and um, uh, people from the financial services sector around how we might best do that. For the MCA uh, now, we've established a future technologies and innovation team uh, and we're working to make the UK flag, uh, the UK ship registry, really the home of green technology and innovation. So known to be helping customers to develop and implement new technologies. We've just, uh, just nearing completion of uh, a technology matrix which will, um, which essentially allows a m more intelligent decision-making process of what technologies to use, particularly useful in the domestic market where the constraints are a little bit less, um, less severe than the international one and where I suspect we'll have a range of solutions. We're doing more and more, again, with colleagues at Department for Transport on um, uh, UK policy making, 
uh, and talking with, uh, with central government about that. And uh, Katie and the team uh, working on updating regulation and finding the right exemptions within uh, existing regulation to allow demonstration uh, uh, ships to be built, uh, uh, allow uh, new technology to be developed. And we're working again with colleagues in DFT uh, uh, on initiatives like the Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition. I think am I right in saying, Mark, the results are out tomorrow on that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so working closely with colleagues on that, uh, uh, which is really aimed at piloting uh, new technologies. And uh, through Katie, who uh, represents the UK on behalf of the government at IMO, uh, really leading high-level discussions internationally, uh, uh, again, alongside DFT colleagues. So that was it. Um, uh, that's our thoughts. It's all up for debate. Um, uh, I hope maybe it clears some of the mists and uh, condenses it down to, uh, to a rather more manageable set of, set of options to talk about. Saskia, back to you. Great. So um, thank you so much for that, Brian. That was um, really helpful. Um, so just a couple of quick notes before we move to the panel. So questions have already started coming in, which is great. I, we thought they might. Um, <laughs> um, so, but do you start sending them in now? So if you're uh, um, what, joining remotely, do you start putting in your questions now? Because yesterday's session, we got to the end, and that's where questions flurried in, and then we couldn't answer all of them. So do you start putting them in as, as the thought comes to you? Um, the other thing is I made a massive mistake and forgot to introduce another panel member who's joining us remotely. So, Nanda, I am so sorry. Um, we are joined by, as well as our distinguished panel in person, we have Nanda, who joins us. There he is. Hello, Nanda. Um, Hello. Hi. <laughs> and he's forgiven me. He sent me an email saying he's forgiven me, so thank you. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll just give you a bit more detail about who's with us. I mean, I'm sure lots of you know everybody on the panel, but I think it's worth knowing. So... Um, Nanda joins us from Wiltzilla, where he is general uh, manager. He has a PhD from Newcastle University. Um, he leads a team of around 75 people at the moment um, who are looking at um, the development of new technologies and products um, and exploring different the preparation and implementation needed of new technology roadmaps for decarbonisation. So, um, as we know, Wiltzilla are at the forefront of a lot of this um, new technology. So, it's fantastic. Um, you're with us, Nanda. Thank you very much. Um, we also obviously have Brian, who you know. Um, we have uh, Nick Brown, who is CEO of Lloyd's Register. So Nick is an international business leader with seven years um, experience leading um, businesses in China during the peak um, growth years there. He's also worked in the Middle East, and obviously he now leads Lloyd's Register, um, and he's working on the mega, mega trends of digitalization and decarbonization. Uh, we also have, uh, who's next up, Domagoy. Uh, so Professor uh, Beresic uh, joins us from um, University College London from the Energy Institute. Um, he's a research associate and um, consultant as well as uh, UMass. Uh, he uses mixed research methods to explore the nature of fuel transition pathways uh, necessary to reach low carbon shipping future. And he, uh, his research interests span policy, political, economy and social, social technical transitions. And we have to say, Domagoy's uh, input has been phenomenally helpful to the MCA. He's fed in a, a few times and has great experience of witnessing systematic change in maritime around fuels in different um, parts of the world. So we're really glad to um, have his input. Um, we also have with us uh, Tom, who's next up. So Tom is in uh, the team that I'm part of as well. So it's a new team at the Mar um, uh, Maritime Coast Guard Agency, and the team is called the Maritime Future Technologies Team. Um, so I'm part of the stakeholder team. So if anybody has questions and you want to engage with us, please do come and talk to us, email, get in contact, because um, we're, we're constantly trying to find out what the sector are thinking, understanding new technology, what people are thinking about, what they're testing. So definitely get in contact. Um, so join, Tom joined the MCA in February this year. Uh, as a maritime emissions reduction engineering lead. Uh, he's previously worked for the Merchant Navy and studied at Cranfield University. He's got experience of management and technical leadership and has a blend of engineering skills. And his key interests are in energy and sustainability, particularly in the built environment. And then at the last but certainly not least is Tanya. Um, so Tanya joins us from um, the London Port Authority. 
uh, and she's head of environment and uh, in the planning and environment department. Um, and she advises on the coordination and implementation of the PLA's environmental work, statutory protection and improvements through um, the Tidal River Thames. She's worked at the, um, the port for over 10 years and has worked on the Thames in previous environmental agency roles. So as you can see, lots of expertise, um, technical from different parts of the sector, lots of expertise around decarbonisation as well. So we're thrilled to have everybody with us. Um, so what we're going to do is just hear your general reflections from Brian's presentation, and then we're going to open up both to the floor here and also online. Um, so maybe, Nick, do you want to give us sort of your, your reflections on Brian's presentation? Yeah, th first of all, thank you for inviting me. And um, um, this is the hot topic, obviously, uh, of, of the industry. Um, and I think it's something that the pace, the pace of change is what's driving just how quickly we now need to try and um, fully understand the readiness of, of various solutions. And I think quite, quite rightly, Brian has pointed out that, that many times people are talking about fuels, and uh, here we're, where we are today uh, in, in the IMO headquarters, there's a big discussion obviously going on uh, about market-based market measures. But I don't think we should take for granted that all of the safety risks for the industry are solvable. Um, and we uh, you know, very much um, see it as, as, as our role as, as class, the classification industry and, 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 and flags like the MCA to make sure we fully understand the risks and um, don't uh, allow well-intended uh, regulations and technical solutions to lead to unintended safety consequences. So I think that's first and foremost that as we go through this decarbonisation transition, we shouldn't be threatening uh, the safety performance, which Brian has already pointed out, already has some gap and a significant gap to close on, on other industries. That said, I don't think um, we can underestimate uh, the talent whether it's innovation talent, uh, an engineering skill that we have within the industry. Um, you know, sometimes we do a rubbish job, I think, at just communicating how more efficient our industry is today compared to even, let's say, 15 years ago. And I think if you looked at the specification of a new building and how much fuel it's consuming today compared to one that might have been built in the, or ordered in the boom period of 2006, six seven you would struggle to find a ship that is not at least 50% more efficient today than just 15 years ago. So I am, from my perspective, I'm convinced that we can uh, address the technical solutions. I think, uh, and this is where much of our work probably since 2014 with um, UMass has been, is trying to understand how do you fully uh, understand the, the sort of three elements of what, what, what we call a, sort of a marine readiness solution. And it's obviously the technical readiness, including everything that relates to health and safety, the commercial viability, and then societal readiness. Mm -hmm. And I think Brian's presentation has very neatly touched on all three of those, because whilst, um, if you look at the total cost of ownership of nuclear and how much money a ship, particularly a large one, would spend on fuel over its 25-year life, nuclear actually, you know, could argue is proven technology, relatively proven as, in terms of maritime application. Um, and we've, we've had rules that haven't been used much for nuclear-powered ships uh, since, I think, the 1960s. Um, but from a societal acceptance, there's some real concerns, particularly in the, the, you know, the international world in which our, our industry uh, shapes. So uh, we ha I see a lot of alignment with uh, the points that Brian pulls out here. And whilst I think it's really critical for us to focus on the end destination, how do we get to 2050, and be prepared that the current 50% target is only likely to become a tougher target. Mm. It's not going to become an easier target okay. going forward. Um, and it might, we might find that society, just look at how much society's expectations have changed in the last three years, really. Um, I, I think um, 
the, the real um, need for us is, is to start getting pilot projects and demonstrator engines or demonstrator vessels, whether they're coastal vessels or short sea vessels, actually into operation and start to really understand from those pilot projects such that we can um, then fully address all of those readiness challenges and then try to standardize and scale up rapidly. So for me, it's, it's a case of making sure that when we finish our week of discussions this week, we can identify those pilot projects and try and make them a reality. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. And um, I think, uh, Nanda, if we can come to you, what are your general th sort of thoughts and reflections on what you've heard? Yeah, thank you. Um, Brian's presentation is, I mean, it's an eye-opener to everybody to see, you know, you, you, it's not just all about technology. Uh, we, yes, as Watsla, we would, we will develop technologies. We will, we are certainly in the road towards decarbonization, developing technologies for it. But technology is one part of the entire puzzle. We can solve issues related to technology. We have to make it safe. We have to make it safe in a way that it's usable uh, uh, without any incidents happening. People need to be trained to handle technology. The other elements of it that whether this technology is going to fly or not is really dependent on people's competence. If you, you need to have people that need to be trained in that art. You, you, you just can't say that we find somebody who is, we know this very well from, from um, a certificate competency person who's worked on a gas carrier or on a, on a tanker um, can easily fit onto a container vessel, but you just can't take a, a person who's worked on a container vessel and, and ask the next day, okay, now you need to work on a gas carrier. You know, that you, you're bound to have accidents because this person is not been, has no training, no skills to handle operations there. So the same goes with technology that we, when we develop technologies, we need to see that it is usable. It's not that we develop a technology that goes to the museum. It has to be effective. It needs to help the society meet the, you know, the societal targets, you know, looking at the environment, uh, decarbonizing. On the other hand, we also know that when you look at, uh, let's just pick ammonia. Uh, when, you, when you touched on ammonia, Brian, it's not that ammonia, the use of ammonia is new to ships. Ammonia was used as a refrigerant uh, 40, 50 years ago, and then it was um, after uh, there was an ammonia leak and, uh, and killed people in, in uh, I think it was in Germany, and then it was um, came in the CFCs, and uh, they were used as refrigerants. But prior to that, there was a breed of seafaring engineers, or sea, seagoing personnel who knew how to handle ammonia. They were skilled in the dark, but you have now two generations gone by where nobody has handled ammonia. So it's not that you cannot handle ammonia, you can handle ammonia, but then we need to make sure that all these people are trained and they, they need to be brought up to speed. Then if I just focus on the, the quantity part, what, what Brian mentioned about, do, do we want to put 5,000 tons of uh, HFO or do we want to have 8,000 tons or 9,000 tons of ammonia? We do not necessarily need to do a swap right from 100% uh, HFO to 100% ammonia. Okay, that's 100% ammonia is hard to burn also in an engine. You need to redesign the engine entirely. Um, but if we just take a slow transition, we, you could also start with small percentages. We don't need to go to 100% ammonia and make it zero carbon. We could start with 10%. Uh, 20%, 30%, so that, that would mean that you're carrying small quantities of ammonia. People are comfortable, the damage, you do your risk control by uh, carrying out small quantities of ammonia. That's possible, certainly possible, and people then slowly will learn. And then as you, uh, you know, it's like any learning process. When you start to walk, uh, and then you, slowly you, you st a small child stands up, and then you, uh, the next thing, take a few steps, and then they start to walk, and then they start to run. And then suddenly they're hopping on a bicycle and they're cycling fast. Then on the on a, so it's it's a learning process. We can start. We do not necessarily do the big bang. We start slow. We gain experience. And I'm certain that we will get there. It's not a it's not a showstopper. We don't have to reach uh, you know 2040. There's still some time time for 2040, 2050. We 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 don't need to do everything now. We can slowly learn. We can start slowly and we can move on. The same thing goes with hydrogen. Yes, for deep sea shipping, it is different. 
if you start to talk about uh, fuel handling system you could you know if you if you want to have a tank that can carry lng methanol and ammonia you can have it but if you talk about carrying uh, hydrogen uh, then then it's 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 a, it's a different beast altogether but certainly uh, you have options available in the today that you you can do it and we can start slow we do not need to wait to solve all the answer all the questions from 0 to 10 and then okay say now we are ready mm. we can we can have five questions answered out of 10 and then we start moving on and then we learn as we go along the way from best option what we see is from a customer's perspective is that it is good if you have a, a fuel flexible platform and you know, we talk about fuel flexibility a lot and uh, when you go and talk to the customer the first thing you hear always is oh it's it's uh, expensive and uh, i made a statement some some years ago to a customer i said uh, what's the what's the price of burning a uh, ton of uh, fuel or hfo and um, he said yeah okay it's it's 500 dollars a ton i said no I, i just asked the price of burning a ton of hfo so you could clearly see that the interest was not was only in buying the hfo there was no interest uh, calculations for uh, separating and you know, cleaning that hfo no price calculations for uh, disposing the sludge or burning the sludge and more importantly the emissions that is going out of the stack because as soon as you add all of this um, when you talk about burning a you know price of burning a ton of hfo it's not 500 anymore it's double it's 1000 and then certainly all the business cases fall in place because it's it's uh, it's expensive so it's 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 a lot of learning that needs to be done uh, now uh, uh, with with the customers and it's a joint effort industry effort it's not that we alone can solve it because we know that from the technology perspective we will probably come with the technology but we need to work with the classification societies with the flag state with um, customers with uh, um charters with suppliers of fuel to make sure that this works and I, i'm i'm convinced we will we will get there it's just a matter of time the the more we can work coherently and together we will get there i'm at least certainly convinced about that fantastic thank you so much nanda for that um and domagoy um what are your sort of initial reflections and thoughts Thank you so much, Saskia, and thank you, Brian, for the wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think it touches upon many, many important points, and also what Nanda said and what Nick said before me. I think uh, really explains and highlights the technical issues and the safety challenges we have. What I would like to go back to is just uh, I think one of the first slides Brian mentioned how this is probably the biggest transition that shipping will undertake or has undertaken the past century or even even more so from 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 the the, the time of sailing and i i think i think this is this is quite uh, quite important to highlight because we are approaching a period where the challenges we face come not just from choosing the type of fuel but also from choosing choosing and developing all of the different procedures technical safety and policy wise to actually to actually make this transition viable and i think here we have two two opposing two opposing issues on one side there's the urgency of actually doing this and understanding that yes 2050 might seem a long way away but if we think about all of the challenges we are facing and all of the technical issues we are facing we we don't really have much time to actually undertake this transition yet at the same time as was as was explained by Nick and and, and Nanda uh, this is something that will take time that we can't just rush through that we have to understand if we're if we're looking into ammonia what are the safety what are the safety issues associated with burning ammonia with storing ammonia with having the crew on board of a vessel actually knowing how to operate an ammonia fueled or a partly ammonia fueled ship uh, the same might be said for hydrogen, the same might be said for some transition fuels such as LNG as well. So uh, we have learned lessons before that this is doable, that this can happen, but that it takes time. 
And here, from this perspective, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would further emphasize the point previously made by Nick ab about this issue about investing in pilots, investing in ways of actually learning by doing, and actually bringing together everyone who is important, both from the ship side, from the land side, from the technical side, and the safety side, of actually understanding how we can learn this process and how we can take this process forward. And this is where the urgency comes into place, because I think a lot of discussions have been taking place. A lot of R&D, I know, has started to take place, but from the perspective of pilots and the perspective of actually building these vessels and trying them out and seeing what works on the ground, I think more has to be done, and, th and this is the time when this actually has to take place. Because the lessons we learn there, whether it's on a national level or an international level, will be the lessons that will feed through to institutions such as the IMO, will feed through different types of working groups, will feed to different types of discussions and different types of individuals who, who are in a position to actually make these these choices and influence these choices. And that can only be done if we actually have real world data to support what we're trying to do. And then the second point from here is that I, I, th I think the presentation also touches upon importance is we're talking about a system-wide change. So the technical issues uh, are almost a foundation. The safety and technical issues are a foundation we have to solve before we even think whether these fuels can, can be put forward to the market to actually be, be, be processed further. But once we solve these issues, it's really about seeing how we can uh, eventually close this price gap between, uh, between the current fuels and, and these zero carbon or transition fuels that we might have in the future. And here, understanding what are the policy options, what are the policy implications, and what are, the, what are some of the mechanisms that we can actually develop, either domestically or internationally, I think is really important and something that we have to start discussing uh, in the long term, perhaps following up from the initial strategy at the IMO to actually understand what could be some of these mid to long term measures. But in, in, the, in the shorter to the intermediate term, understanding what countries such as the UK can actually do about this on a domestic level. So first of all, we're talking about different types of fuels, so, such, as, such as we saw in the presentation, uh, battery electric or hybrid vehicles, uh, vessels that can, that, that, can, that can be created or be built for domestic shipping, but also understanding whether, whether the domestic market can be a test bed for some of these technologies with the right policies in place that can then be expanded further, that can be developed, whether it's a hybrid vessel running on ammonia part of the time, whether it's a hydrogen fuel vessel, or perhaps even nuclear, and how, how, the, how the public reacts to these vessels and what the policy um, measures have to be in place to actually see that these vessels can be run profitably under certain conditions. And, and this is, I would say, also, also an experiment and, and, and also a... And, and, and also an area of analysis as much so as the technical and the safety standards are. Because actually understanding how, in, under what circumstances this might be profitable is incredibly important. Because it's, it's not simply to do with saying, okay, this can be the carbon price, if we're talking about a market-based measure, this is how much ammonia costs, so this is how much hydrogen costs, this is how much we have to cut, cut down the cost. Because, the, the, because once we start developing the, these issues, we, we do see development, first of all, of economies of scale, secondly, unforeseen challenges, and thirdly, perhaps, also the different market forces that not, might not be visible at the moment. And I, I think my final point would be uh, this aspect of really appreciating from, from the systems perspective that we are talking about a transition that will include other actors or has to include other actors and other, and, and, and other factors beyond shipping. So in order for this to be viable in the long term, at least in my opinion, I think understanding how these fuels can be developed and how, uh, in, in partnership with other sectors, with other demand sources and with other uh, production levels, uh, w whether we're talking about hydrogen or ammonia or other fuels, I think is incredibly important. I think Brian touched upon that with regards to biofuels. Yes, it's all well and nice to do our Econ um, economic analysis of understanding how biofuels can be profitable, but there is a there is an overall demand and supply of biofuels that you can realistically accomplish. And when you take other sectors into account, well, perhaps some things become more or less realistic when you start thinking about it. And the, the same can be said about hydrogen, the same can be said about ammonia. Some things that might, might, might initially make less sense market-wise when you're looking at it from the perspective of shipping and isolation, when you look at a set of policy measures that encompasses more sectors, 
uh, actually starts making more sense because you can pull resources, you can you can uh, divide risks between different sectors, you can make investment scenarios that actually are more viable in the long term and that have a return on investment that might be faster or might be more uh, more uh, sensible, so to say. So combining these figures together really tells us that yes, there are many different challenges involved. There's an incredible amount of urgency involved with us actually starting this as early as possible. But the only way we can do it is, is if we actually look at uh, how we can start doing trial, R&D, and pilot projects as soon as possible. And here I think pilots would be my, my, my main emphasis. And uh, from pilots going to some niche markets where you can actually try out these technologies, see which ones might work, and see much, which ones might be more or less viable. And I'm, I'm sure we can, we're going to see more different perspectives for, for, from, from uh, co my colleague panelists as well on that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and Tom, what are your kind of thoughts? Firstly, thanks, Saskia, for a great introduction, and um, I enjoyed the presentation, Brian. Um, it was really interesting when you said that no, you said something around the, the fact of, you know, not one person owns the, the solution, we all do. And obviously that rings true with, with what Nanda's saying, and Domagoy too. Um, if you think of it as a system of systems, it's not even a directed system of systems. You know, no, there's not one person who can control it. So and I think what I liked about the presentation is that there are some probably what I call hard truths in there, you know, that, that we all need to face. Um, and I, I like that it came straight to the point on those. Um, I think it's, it's lucky, uh, we're lucky at the MCA that we've got an engaged CEO who understands this problem and that we can blend that kind of top-down um, thinking of the system dynamics and, you know, the limits of the chemistry and physics, but also then blend that with the, the bottom-up approach that we need to do in terms of the science-based evidence around what the solutions are as well. So I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, obviously, this, you know, as you said, Brian, the, the presentation is more around the, the international stage and the end point. And obviously, there's um, the other questions, the key questions we've got to answer for the domestic part as well, and also the, the transition, and particularly the pilot projects that, that you've mentioned, Don Bagoy. Um, and Nanda, I think, are, are particularly key in those. One, one of the other aspects, though, which we, we obviously went past is, is the energy efficiency side of things, because it's, it's easy to, to kind of forget that in part or, or not emphasise it enough. But, you know, there's, there's a term which I came up originally or came across originally in construction, which is the only green energy is the energy you don't use in the first place. And although it's kind of corny, it, it, it's true because obviously... For every jewel more we use in shipping is another piece of infrastructure that has to be in place, another piece of um, infrastructure that we have to operate and maintain and a cost to us. And also, a, a, you know, that will slow us in our trajectory to actually decarbonising as well. So um, there's also an extra effect of that. that The more efficient ships get, the less energy density becomes an issue as well. So there's, there's obviously another factor which is useful for us. I think the last point is... Shipping to date, I don't think, has been driven really by a sustainability agenda. And this, you know, this systems thinking that we're talking about, actually thinking to all of the aspects, and I like Nanda's example of, you know, the difference between how much, uh, how much is it to burn a tonne of fuel versus how much is it to buy a tonne of fuel is a, is a, a, great, um, a great way of um, expressing that, I think. So I think one of the things we want to make sure is that we're, ensuring that we do do a sustainable decarbonisation, that we're not creating a problem tomorrow from the, the things that we do today. And I think that would be something different to what we've done in the past. We haven't looked at it in that way in the past. So I think that's, that's really important. You know, if we could have one legacy, it would be that we've um, helped to change the maritime industry to taking these things, the wider issues, into consideration, having a proper, you know, d doing the systems thinking so that in every decision we make in the future, we've actually considered the whole rather than just considering the, you know, a few of the factors. And, and I liked your, your point, Don McGoy, that that's wider than just the maritime industry as well, because sometimes things don't make sense until you take the wider context into, into consideration. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. And Tanya, what are your thoughts? Well, I think... Um it's been really interesting. A lot of people have said together and working together, and, and Brian's presentation mentioned ports quite a lot. Um, 
but all the, the references to standards um, have been mainly vessels. Uh, and I think that's something we need to, to sort of break that, that sort of boundary of the steel around a vessel and, and think about it as that transition from shore, uh, ship to shore. Um, and I think, I think ports will acknowledge they're part of the solution. Uh, we're certainly working internationally uh, with the IOPH. Um, that we take a uh, sort of global view with local action being a focus. There's things like clean uh, fuels groups, trying to work out what that um, that con conclusion would be in terms of the conversions. And um, it's interesting that you know the the destination is is really important in terms of shipping, but for ports we've also got to be ready for a transition without having stranded assets and in spaces that are constrained. Um, going forward, how we look at um, perhaps a local uh, generation solution rather than a shipping importing of cargo uh, type of solution might be something that we need to think about a, a little bit differently. And um, while um, I represent a port that isn't necessarily on the edge of a urban environment, it runs centrally through it, um, we have um, quite a focus on the safety aspect of those uh, considerations. We are um, very proactive around things, things like incentivization is something we already use and ports are very key to that. But when we are talking about the safety of uh, standards, we're not talking just about the operation of the vessels. We're talking about the pier staff, the terminals, the, um, the services that might come into play, um, and the technology that provides that infrastructure um, and that is beyond the, the vessel uh, that we need to prepare in time for those vessels to come. The chicken and egg, um, in a sense, is something that um, it's really useful to have that those four, Brian, but there's still quite a, a long list in terms of the amount of space a port might have uh, to provide uh, to a ship. Um, and in terms of emergency response, um, the shoreside space and the services that might be possible for a port to provide throughout the transition to that destination and providing the training and the safety of all of those thousands of people that uh, are working in those terminals is, is quite some challenge. So I think that point about working together is key. Um, working beyond those traditional boundaries and thinking about those immediate surroundings that might be affected in case of a safety uh, concern. Um, and those pilots are going to be key. But I would say that there is a call that the ports are bound by those regulations that you mentioned earlier, Brian, and we will need exemptions to allow those pilots to go ahead in our ports and our areas, and we will need to put those infrastructure and safety uh, processes in place. So please continue to talk to us as we are here and inviting us onto the table to talk, and for me to say it is, um, as a, is very welcome from, from our, our perspective, because um, I made a note of the number four gigawatts um, is not something I'm gonna find easily in London for shipping. So um, we are gonna need all the help and all the time we have in order to get there in the rough time for 2050. So um, that would be my call to action in the together uh, converging those safety um, um, permits and making our very large public perception we have locally here um, something that we can accept nuclear or hydrogen in to London in the future will be quite some challenge. For sure. Okay, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, okay, so I think um, because uh, we've got some people in person and some remote, I think let's go to the remote questions first because we've had a flurry of those in. Um, so if the people in the room want to start thinking about what your key questions might be, we'll come to you in a second. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions to different individuals. So remember your question then, and then answer. Um, so we've got some really fantastic questions and some of them have been answered already. So I'm not gonna list every single one of them for people that have written them in. Um, if you feel it hasn't been answered, then obviously come back. Um, so Tom, we have a couple of questions on liquid hydrogen and organic liquid hydrogen carriers and what we might feel about them. So I'll come to you first on that. Um, and Tanya, we've had a question about how open should the UK be to um, international pilots and working with other port authorities, even potentially in the UK, but uh, certainly internationally. Um, and then Nick 
there's a fantastic question about nuclear here about the public perception and I think the uh, the person asking the question is saying we know that there's this public perception issue but what are we going to do to solve that so I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that or advice for bodies like the MCA and the Department of Transport um, Brian we've got one on carbon capture um, how, what do we think about that um, and then Domagoy, we had one for you about how what the, what should the UK do, but you actually answered it before we even got there. So I'll come back to you with some other questions. Um, I think one that I had for you, Domagoy, was um, from your studies. Um, what advice do you have for the UK maritime sector? So not just the government. Um, obviously, you've given that answer, but about the sector more generally, what advice do you have? Um, so if we uh, Maybe if we just go down the line, that might be um, easier. And Nanda, I'm going to come to you um, in a second as well. So, Brian, carbon capture. Carbon capture. Uh, okay, so uh, could mean a whole lot of different things. Let's just try and try and run through them. Uh, so, uh, carbon capture from the air to make some sort of carbon-based molecule. Uh, if if we had to capture carbon to make a carbon-based molecule to replace all the bunker fuel we use in the UK, we would need to process one million cubic metres of air per second. And if you size up the process kit to do that, it's unimaginable. Um, so ambient carbon capture to reuse the CO2 captured in some sort of manufacturing process does not scale up. And in my view, it's a complete distraction. Um, I would just kill it dead. Um, <laughs> Because it's words, well, as a, sorry, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an option for, for replacing yeah. replacing fuels, it's just not got the scalability that, that we're going to want. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure it will exist in some dimensions, but it's it's not going to provide the size of solution for shipping. Uh, it could mean uh, capturing carbon from uh, the exhaust of uh, uh, ships, who, which are burning carbon-containing con molecules, and you could recycle the CO2 back to a manufacturing process. Again, just, just give a sense of scale. If, if a big container ship, currently 5,000 tonnes of heavy fuel oil on board, if that, had, if that had to capture all the carbon that it created from that um, 5,000 tonnes of fuel oil, it has to be stored as a pressurised liquid above six bars, or it turns into a big lollipop, um, uh, you'd need two kilometres of three metre diameter pressurised bullet tanks to, to store it in. It's just the scale of it's enormous. Never mind all the hassle of recycling at the other end and so on. So it just doesn't feel that that's got the, got the right scale to it uh, and requires huge energy actually to, to do that carbon capture and the, the compression of the CO2. So that doesn't feel uh, practical. The other, the other one it could be is waste streams from other processes uh, and capturing the CO2 from those. That is viable. Uh, you can produce methanol and other fuels that way. The issue, the question is then, long term, that system still emits CO2 from it, the whole system. So you've got to feel if we're really moving towards zero CO2, and that does feel like it's a destination, that can only be a transient, transient solution. That's why I'd say I think you know, methanol does have a place in the transient solutions, but... I just can't see how it's going to be part of that zero carbon economy. It's not. It's not zero carbon in that model. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. Thank you very much, Brian. And Nick. Um, you, yes. What? Do, what? How can we convince, <laughs> convince and talk to the public about this? I, I think a, a big part of it is education. Um, so a couple of elements here. Um, obviously, most transport sectors, and definitely ours included only really gets noticed when things go wrong, whether it's our trains being delayed or, or incidents um, around the world. Um, and I think, I think it's a, it's, nuclear is going to be a very interesting debate going forward because clearly nations have vastly different uh, political stances on nuclear. Um, and I think uh, a lot of that is is, is driven by, um, you know, what captures votes. So it's very political. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the, the big advantages that we have as an industry, although we talk about it as a disadvantage, is is global regulation 
on one set of standards. If we think about um, you know tragedies, whether it be in Japan or uh, elsewhere around the world, when there has been land-based nuclear um, tragedies and uh, you know major loss of life and huge economic uh, impact, it's been through I think older technology that is no longer valid. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be technology that would be considered today. Um, and it's been governed by national regulation rather than global standardised regulation. And um, I, th I believe we only really have a chance of changing public perception through seeing whether or not government will support it. Um, the challenge, of course, is, um, you know, Nuclear, we're only, in, in our view at least, nuclear is best suited for long distance voyages, which means Trans-Pacific, probably, or, or, or other, you know, Singapore, Rotterdam type, type voyages, and that means going past a huge amount of nations and coastlines. And therefore, it's very difficult to find the right application uh, for where we can actually put a pilot project for nuclear, if it's, you know, outside of naval applications today. Yeah. Uh, you could argue we've already got enough demonstrators of nuclear because of the amount of uh, naval insta installations they are. Mm -hmm. But but that again is an education piece which I think is, is, is something that we could play a role in and trying to understand, you know, what, what has gone wrong when there has been big uh, tragedies around the world and how that would be almost impossible to replicate in a maritime application. I think there's something as well around framing, isn't there, about how we tell the story um, yeah. of nuclear, and people just don't know that there are ships out there with this no, already. It's, and it, it, it's viewed as risk. Yeah. Which um, is, is, you know, it's all about, you know, it's a little bit like wearing seatbelts and things like that. It's just viewed as something that is not, not something you 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 would uh, accept if you have a choice of alternatives. Mm. I think that's, that for, as an outsider to this sector, this is the issue, isn't it? There isn't any golden bullet solution and it feels like it is going to be a mixed picture and we have to be honest about the pluses and negatives of all fuel types, including what we're currently using, which also is not ideal. So, yeah, it's a difficult challenge, but an interesting one. Okay, so then, um, who's next? Uh, Domagoy, you say your question was around advice to the UK maritime sector in general, not just government. What, what are your thoughts there? It's a hard question, but it's uh, it's an interesting one as well. <laughs> so I think I think I think there's a there's 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 a few different aspects to it. And I, co coming back to what I think Thomas mentioned in 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 his discussion previously, th this issue about uh, we already have some solutions in place, such as energy efficiency measures. There are existing measures in place that sometimes, and some of the research that uh, colleagues colleagues of mine have done as well, have shown that. Often you have measures that do exist that actually save save certain segments of the industry, whether ship owners, charters, operators, whether they save them money. They, they do exist; they're viable, but for some reason they're not being they're not being taken up, or they're not being developed, or or or, or actually uh, becoming the norm. And many reasons for this, but sometimes it's information asymmetry. Sometimes it's just it's just a, a lack of understanding or lack of or, or a lack of knowledge around what actually has to happen. So here I would say, from that perspective, just uh, a sense of being proactive and understanding what options already exist. How can these options benefit me as a ship owner, me as a charter, me as a fuel supplier, or, or whatever, whatever other segment of the industry, and, and, try, and trying to introduce best practices. I think that is really important as a first step. And then secondly also, Understanding uh, what can be done, what can be done in, in, in the medium term, and when, by the medium term, I, I mean the, in the next few years. So, uh, when we're talking about the private sector, probably many, many, many companies will not necessarily spend a lot of their research what will happen in 10 or 20 years from now. But in the medium term, this this idea that if you can if you can see how you can get involved in, in trials, in pilots, in research, in analysis is incredibly important because the, 
there is more and more funding available. There are different options available to partner with different with different companies, and sometimes these options are partnering and uh, applying for grants and and going through them c can seem tedious. With the revo rewards of actually doing it seem elusive or far in the future. But 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 if it goes through well, the re the rewards can be even from a financial perspective, really large for, from, from the perspective of either first mover advantage or just from learning or for presenting yourself as a as a valuable company. And inevitably, a lot of the pilots, a lot of the research that takes place will result in, 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 in a conclusion which will say, well, perhaps that's not the way you're supposed to do it. Perhaps uh, five out of ten times you will say the conclusion from this pilot is perhaps this is not the solution or perhaps there's there's more work that has to be done but I think I think even even that actually provides a pool of knowledge that you can build on that you can build your expertise as a company but on the other side, on the positive side, if you actually do end up creating a pilot or creating a new technology that gives you that 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 position as a first mover in this industry, the rewards can be massive. And 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 here, not being afraid and and being open to be flexible to actually explore opportunities, partner with other companies, see what's there now, and see what could be there five, ten years from now. Is, is 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 incredibly beneficial, and I and I, I think we we've seen that in some other industries, in some other sectors in the past. If this is done correctly, it it can it can provide many different uh, financial benefits for the companies and also for the economic growth of 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 societies as a whole. And I think the UK here is quite well positioned because. Uh, as a uh, as a country, there's there's so many different aspects of this transition that you can actually do domestically. You have you have uh, you have R and D. You have experts in shipping. You have a ship owning uh, a shipping transition uh, tradition that goes back uh, centuries and that has been growing and growing and growing ever since from from, from a renewable energy perspective, from a, from a zero carbon perspective. Perhaps not as much in, in in shipping over the past 20 or 30 years, but in other sectors that's now be that's now being adapted in in to shipping as well. So actually taking this forward w offers short-term opportunities from an energy p efficiency perspective to actually lower your operating costs if you're a ship owner or, or operator or uh, other part of the actual uh, ship side industry. But in the medium term, uh, investing in research, investing in, in different types of pilots, investing in, in, in different types of analysis of what could be what could be the safety, the technical procedures in place, uh, can, 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 can give massive benefits for you perhaps as a company, but in the longer term for the wider, uh, in the longer term for actually exporting these technologies uh, globally. And, and, and I think here, uh, another point to be made is where this transition once takes place, w once, once the consensus is reached of what might be some of the main procedures, uh, bunkering procedures, what might be some of the main fuels, what might be some of the safety procedures, uh, the, the first countries that actually establish this will have not just an advantage of actually exporting the technology and exporting their expertise, but also have a have, uh, Incredible position with regards to trade with these new with 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 this new shipping shipping infrastructure that's being created, and I and I would I would emphasize the point that, that Tanya made previously about this aspect about you don't want to be in the side of the position where you're actually creating a technology now that's already the technology of two or three years uh, in the past that you don't want to create those stranded assets. And if you're not doing the R&D, if you're not researching, if you're not one of those, uh, whether it's a port authority, whether it's a ship owner that actually, that, has, that actually knows what's happening now at this very moment, you might be the one who actually invests in a lot of bunkering infrastructure for a technology that m might already be obsolete. And then you will end up with stranded assets. And uh, you won't know where to go from there. So I, 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 w I, I would leave it at that. Great, thank you very much. Um, and Tom, what do we feel about liquid hydrogen and organic liquid and hydrogen carriers? It's a, it's a very general question, firstly, so I'll uh, try and keep my answer pretty pretty general. But um, I think, firstly, there's a, there's a few considerations here. There's obviously, like we've talked about in this, there's the international piece versus the domestic piece, and they don't, there's, there's a different, you know, d different um, things that affect those two things which make, make it different. There's also, whether you're talking about carrying this, you know, in terms of transporting energy or whether you're talking about using it. And there's obviously studies that have been done already which look at, you know, 
price and other constraints, you know, purity, et cetera, as to whether you'd look at using something like liquefied hydrogen or, or an organic carrier. I guess the, the two things that come up probably the most are the energy density and the, and the safety aspects, and particularly, like we've discussed, with all of these new fuels, particularly the ones in Brian's presentation, particularly liquefied hydrogen and ammonia, you know, they are um, significantly different in the way we'd have to treat them in terms of the um, regulation certification, you know, the training education and the certification of officers um, and the safety culture as well, which is not, not one and the same with the education and training necessarily. So I think they, the two of them obviously have different characteristics in that sense in terms of safety because um, if, you, if you ignore the carcinogenic liquid organic hydrogen carriers and you focus on some of the others, then yes, from a, from a pure safety perspective, they're probably more similar to what we have today in terms of their um, dangers to the, to the people around them. Um, also, some of them have different characteristics in terms of, obviously, if you were to do a mass release of one of these carriers versus a mass release of ammonia or a mass release of liquefied hydrogen. So there's very different considerations there as well. Um, in terms of energy density, obviously, they are not as energy dense as liquefied hydrogen. So in a lot of the comparisons you'll see, obviously, they, they, they don't come out as strongly as that. Obviously, you do have to take into account, though, the actual in-tank density once you've taken into account all of the construction that goes around it and everything, so what it actually looks like. Um, I think, as we said, this is a hypothesis of what the, what the solutions could be. This is more focused on international. And obviously, we've got the work to do to actually do this, the, you know, the evidence-based approach that the looking at the whole picture, which is just wider than just this, you know, this continual safety density and cost piece, you know, because we have to look at the regulatory aspects, we have to look at um, the sustainability and a number of other factors in order to evaluate these better. So probably, you know, you could end up oversimplifying this in, in the comments I'll give. But I think one thing, though, to think about is, um, if, if we think to the hydrogen-based fuels, obviously the power demand, like we said, you know, realistically, depending on which one of them you look at, you're looking at some, if you look at the UK um, requirement of how much energy we require, that's something between three and 15 gigawatts, depending on the fuel. And if you think about, um, again, offshore wind and other sustainable um, means of generation, they aren't generating 100%, 100% of the time. So this is significant in terms of the grid that you're adding. Even if you take the future energy grid and what that looks like, the maritime fuel demand alone would be significant. So I think that's worth just remembering that whatever we're thinking about with these, that's significant. Um, and I think the last point is just the pilots that, that Don McGoy mentioned. You know, that's where some of these we're going to see more information coming from. There's, there's you know, there's a there's a point where you can you run out of um you run out of room don't you in terms of analysis and you need real real data that's what we need around some of these especially to understand in reality whether we can overcome some of the safety considerations so fantastic um so tanya i'm going to come to you next but nanda just so you get some time to reflect on your question um we've had a question in about um standard ship design and what we all know that that needs to change but what can what can happen to speed that process up so that's your question that will come to you in the, in a minute but so tanya um how open should the uk be to international piloting and collaboration what are your thoughts um well the short answer is very um i think um we as a uk port uh, being the first to put an air quality strategy and to use a uh, a differential pricing for greener ships under the environmental ship index wouldn't have been able to do that without the international research and working with the international ports in America and Europe uh, and, and further afield um, without some certainty about how that works. There are ports uh, particularly uh, in America but elsewhere that are ahead of uh, the UK and there's lots of technology and trials in, in, <laughs> in other locations um, that we could benefit without having to um, to get our toes wet, as it were. Um, but by the same token, I mean, we're all different ports um, 
vessels operations are all different across the UK and across the world we, as long as we recognise the differences in those cases and can apply those across to the UK then then that's perhaps a, a, a starter um, I think in terms of sort of uh, the ship uh, to shore aspect when we're talking about pilots for international shipping or, or at least even some of the green routes that's uh, proposed in the clean maritime plan that absolutely needs to have a pilot that has the ports and both uh, both sides of the the channel or um, you know the countries involved so I, I think we're all I think the point I'd make though is we're all working to the same goal the IMO standards that is as you've said getting stronger likely um, we we've got to learn and get as much information from all of these other uh, solutions and, that have been pr proposed elsewhere. Yes, they're different, and yes, Norway has a tax that we don't have in the UK, and yes, they're, they're, the ports are funded and structured differently and shipping's dealt with differently. But as long as we acknowledge that, we're, we're still talking about systematic technology adoption rather than um, trying to be Norway or <laughs> Amsterdam or wherever it happens to be. Great, thank you very much. And uh, Nanda, what are your thoughts about how we speed up um, standard ship design? Yeah, okay. I, I, I would take a few steps back before going to the standard ship design because standard ship design is more for the future. And um, you could look at this question from a different perspective as you know, all the panelists here have mentioned about a pilot vessel and we need to run pilots. Sometimes before you introduce something as a standard, we need to do field tests. We need to run these pilots to make sure that things are running fine and we get some data from there based on which we do this um, future ship designs. Or we go out, we take the risk, we put something entirely new and then you know it goes bang. Uh, nothing works and things are uh, going deathless here and there. If you look from a decarbonization perspective, um, you know everybody talks about standard vessels, standard vessels. Now, you even if you try to build uh, a lot of new ships and we want to standardize that and go on, we still cannot meet the requirements of uh, this emissions target because you probably would with, a, with just looking at shipping as a sector. But if you look at the holistic picture from um, from uh, you know mining and uh, building the ship and then you know. Uh, then getting doing the sea trials, all of that. The carbon footprint of building a ship is far more than actually upgrading an existing vessel. So just think from this perspective that we, you build a ship and you build a ship for a 25 year lifetime. And to build that ship, you've, the, you've already had a carbon footprint. And you expect that carbon footprint that is one time short that's gone out, would I do the next time after 25 years? But if I say now, no, after five years or 10 years, I bring a new ship in and I need to standardize it and, and uh, run it on new fuels and so on, you've actually not exploited the, or you know really used the carbon footprint from the previous asset that you had. So the point I want to make here is that you know if you want to meet if you want to meet the greenhouse uh, the, uh, the decarbonization targets that we have in front of us it's very important to do retrofits and when you want to go down the route with retrofits you do pilots pilot vessels are very important and that's a, that's a it's a it's good to run this field test you get a lot of experience you train the crew and it's a slow process because you just don't do a you know a, a leap from one day to the next day it's a, it's a slow transition we will do and you need these retrofits because you just don't scrap a vessel because uh, the main propulsion engine, which is the heavy, biggest fuel consumer, consumes 70 to 75 percent of the fuel and emits the most uh, CO2 emissions from the stack. Just because I cannot make it run on a different fuel, I scrap the entire vessel. And mass it is gone. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense from that perspective. So this is what, what I believe the, the path is going forward. You run pilots, pilots for retrofits, vessels that are that have five, you know, five, ten years old, still have what another 10 to 15 years lifetime left. They have those vessels, you can convert them, and then you learn out of that experience, and then what you learn out of them, you put it into the standard vessel designs for the future. If we start with, uh, we will have a standardized design now and we will know everything. We will not have, as I said earlier, we will not have all those questions answered. 
it needs time but we need to work on that right away and and all uh, and with the whole industry to make sure that that happens so a big focus at least for the first decade to start with to prepare for 2040 and 20, up to 2030 we should focus on running these pilots running these field tests seeing what 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 experiences we gain for it so that we can do the first time right the next time because you build a standard design and then you say oh no this is not working you again i need to scrap this vessel does it make sense absolutely not no that's a very good point um nick i wondered if you wanted to add anything on that i mean we saw this morning um the ceo of mersk has said that um he believes that nobody should be it should be out it should be ruled out that anybody's ordering new ships that are based on carbon so i don't know what your thoughts are on that or if you've got anything to add on on ship design um i i do think uh you know in order to have an innovative industry we need competition in the industry but i also think um there's a lot we could learn from efficiencies of standardization and the benefits of safety from standardization um we've talked a lot in the room already about competence in the industry and um whilst there's lots of work needed on sdcw i think we all we all agree uh you know if 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 you look at the aviation industry those people including the cab, the, the cabin crew are trained for a specific aircraft yes. and you compare that to just night and day where we are as an industry and our and our safety record if we could get a greater level of standardization in our industry i'm pretty certain that would come with some significant um safety benefits but i I I I I absolutely hear where Nando is coming from. We probably need more innovation going on in our industry today than ever before and it needs to happen at a a a faster pace than ever before. Um where I would where I think there's a real opportunity for our industry is to stop reinventing the wheel. We are, you know, across various industry bodies, various nations, we're all working on the same thing. and we're not very good at sharing and i think there's a big opportunity for us to be more open and treat decarbonization as a team sport great that's a really good point um okay so i think um i feel really mean to you guys because you've come all the way into london to see us say so let's um open it up to the floor in person we have some lovely human actual human beings so yep yeah, do you want to go ahead yeah thanks for mike uh thanks Uh, particularly Brian for the presentation and all the panelists for some really good answers to questions and some really interesting stuff there. Uh, I, I could ask loads of questions, but I think I'll focus down on some of the fundamentals. Uh, interestingly, speaking of transition, I myself have gone through somewhat of a transition from the nuclear industry in the past into maritime, uh, but not nuclear maritime, uh, wind actually. And so uh, my my colleagues and I are developing a, a technology for wind propulsion of ships, which aims to save not. 10 or 20% but 80 to 100% of emissions from shipping. And so I've got kind of two observations there one of which is that I would say on the nuclear point uh, quite unequivocally don't go there. It's not a question of safety and operation it's a question of safety after operation. You know the lifetime of a nuclear reactor is perhaps 25 30 years. The lifetime of the stuff that you have to store and keep safe once you've used it is 50,000 years. 50,000 years ago we were stabbing saber-toothed tigers in the snow and you know living in caves so it's it's really quite impossible to plan a maintenance program for the next 50,000 years which keeps all that stuff boxed up safely and even if you discount safety the economics just doesn't work the cost of looking after that when you price it into the cost of nuclear it's not a viable option and and to discount that is just a cowboy option so i, I think that's that's a, a point i'd like to make and i'd like to so sort of ask ask a question on that as to whether that was factored into the calculations on nuclear um and i think the other flip side of it is why not wind i can understand why perhaps it might have been left out because a lot of the if you look at the industry at the moment most options are on the fringes of fuel saving or perhaps not the fringes that that you know substantial reductions of 10 or 20% as i say but but not the 80 to 100% that we're looking at um we may be unique but then again there may be other people out there with good ideas that are looking out to do it and do it more so was it considered that that there might have been options for wind which uh, which could contribute massively to the decarbonization effort and also might there be other technologies on that basis that have been 
overlooked because perhaps at the moment we're assuming that they can't uh, take a, a significant portion of the load. Great. And did you, sorry, did you say where you were from? Which organisation? Yeah, Blue Water Engineering, and the, the concept we're developing is called Skytug, which uh, hopefully you'll see more about over the coming weeks. Brilliant. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. I think what we'll do is we'll take a cluster of three questions and then get the panel to respond. So is there another question we can take? Yep. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, David Rush. Uh, so I'm from the Ministry of Defence. I'm the Chief Engineer for Auxiliary Shipping, largely responsible for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Ships, design, the safety and the engineering. Um, my question, I think, is for Brian, but it could be for any of the panel, really. He talked about the sort of cross-sector issues and, you know, biofuel might be hoovered up by the aviation. Um, who's going to referee a cross-sector? Who's actually going to make sure there's fair play for the research and development, um, you know, for the physical resources and for the human resources? Thank you. OK, great question. Anybody else from the, the floor? No? OK, we'll keep thinking. We'll come back to you. Um, so, yeah, where, do, where should we go with the wind and the nuclear one? Uh, Tom, maybe, do you want to take that one? And then, Brian, you take the one on cross-sector collaboration. Yeah, no problem. I think on the wind side of things, as we said, this is, this is the kind of hypothesis. This is more focused on the international kind of fleet. So certainly this isn't the kind of under, you know, that, that's the top-down thinking um, based on a number of things. As I said, one of the things that we're doing is putting together the, the sums behind it all and how it actually looks when you think of all of the factors. And certainly wind is not off the table, if you see what I mean, because it's, we have to, you know, we, we're in the unique position that we don't have to choose a technology. We can be technology agnostic, so we can look across all of these and do the comparisons. But obviously the, the focus, certainly within the, the technology matrix that we're developing, is more how that looks to the domestic sector rather than international particularly, but it's certainly not off the table. No, no technology is actually off the table because what, how would we discount it before we've analysed it? So it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So. I think as well from what we've been doing in the team, it's, it's, it's on the table. So I think it was in, it's around the slide where um, Brian was yeah, talking about the efficiency me measures. So it's, it's very much part of the picture. Um, I think that's part of the problem, isn't it? The, the solutions are, it is a very complex picture, um, which I think is created some inertia, but it's definitely part of the process. All renewables and um, energy efficiency is like, absolutely critical to the picture, I think, for sure. Um, Brian, do you want to answer the one about um, yeah, gosh. refereeing? Um, I, it, it, so reflecting on it, it, feel, it feels to me as if there's, there's, there's maybe a couple of questions underneath it, one of which is um, uh, how do we sort out in the long term where, where the biofuels that get produced are used I suspect, honestly, the open market will sort that out. The, the sectors that depend on it most strongly will be prepared to pay more, more for it, and that'll straighten itself out. I think, though, if I'm understanding correctly, and shout if I haven't understood it correctly, I think you're also saying there's a short-term question about who, get, who gets to play with biofuel that's available today and learn, learn about where it can be used. That's a really interesting question, not something... I thought about. I guess if I took a just a UK perspective on that, um, you know, we are literally in lockstep with our colleagues at Department for Transport. I talk to uh, Richard Moriarty, who runs the Civil Aviation Authority, on a pretty much a weekly weekly basis, and of course the DFT Maritime team talks to their aviation team, and I know the executive uh, meet together. So uh, th there is. Uh, certainly within government, there, there's a lot of liaison uh, between between the sectors. I think um, uh, I think in, in in UK terms, over the next few years, that's sort of the only place where that refereeing can be can be done realistically. I can't see how the market sorts that out. I think the market's role is in sorting out the long term picture and who's who's ultimately really really dependent on the sort of energy density that um, biofuels brings, which is one, one of their big advantages. Have I understood your question correctly? Thank you. Great, thank you. So I think as well, so it's a kind of two-way dialogue. It'd be really good for people both watching and also in the room to kind of give us your reflections as well. I mean, so the two questions for you guys, I'll, I'll get you to ask some questions as well, but 
to give you some uh, time to think. Um, does this does the hypothesis sort of chime with your organisations and where you guys are at and what you're thinking? And same to the people um, out there. But also, um, it would be great to hear what else you think the MCA could do, what, what other things you would want us to be thinking about in our, our journey moving forward. So those are two questions for you that I'm going to come back to both you online and in the room. But um, whilst you're pondering that, are there any other questions in the room for the panel? Any other burning questions? Yep. <clears throat> it's kind of a question and a comment to uh, Don Gregory. Um, interested in energy efficiency, but also run the Exhaust Gas Cleaning System Association and so on. <clears throat> I think Brian started off with an assumption of triple growth in the coming years. Um, Uruguay Round of the World Trade or Organization brought in the massive growth. Do you really think that that will continue? Um, you know, is there maybe a bit of an over-assumption there that we could think about. We talked about 30% savings available. What's going up into the atmosphere? We need to save today, I think. You know, what we can do next year and the year after is great, but if we could start to reduce things today, um, wouldn't that be something that we should be focusing on? And then last me, my little hobby horse, are we really measuring efficiently? And I know Tom, I've had discussions with Tom on this. Doesn't the industry need to measure more accurately what the, the, the fossil carbon emissions are and, and get that reported in real time, you know, so that we do know what's going on, <clears throat> where ships are, how they're being used, and uh, what their emissions are? Great, thank you. Brian, do you want to respond? Yeah, I, maybe, maybe Saskia if I answered, have a go at answering the first two and the, the last time I know Nick, Nick has okay. some, some views on that and you might want to pick that one up, date, uh, Nick, the, the, the data thing. Uh, three times, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that was sort of part of why um, I think Tom gave quite a range on the renewable, um, uh, it, it, it added incremental renewable uh, energy generation that would be required. You're absolutely right. I think we'd sort of freely admit and talk to colleagues in central government. I think one of the questionable assumptions is you know, to what extent does shipping tonne miles continue to grow and to what extent does world trade adjust in a quite different way? And uh, being absolutely frank, uh, we've just taken an assumption. Might be right, might be wrong, might be double, might stay the same. Uh, I think the broad order of magnitude dimensions of the issue remain similar, uh, but I wouldn't hang my hat on um, world shipping trebling. Um, I think you're absolutely bang on over the efficiency measures. And I, th I think... Um, Again, it's a bit of a topic in conversations this morning. I think you know it's really noticeable that we're just not getting even the more straightforward energy efficiency measures retrofitted quickly to shipping. And there is a question, I think, about you know is there a more immediate need for incentives slash disincentives, some sort of market measures to encourage adoption, retrofit. Uh, uh, Picking up Nanda's, Nanda's point about retrofitting, is, is there something needed now that we can start to grab a hold of that 30% that could be available with technologies we know about? So I think it's a great point. Nick, would you mind picking up the other one? Yeah, well, um, thanks, Brian. I think um, in, 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 our, in the Lloyd Register paper that we've worked on with the uh, FT and released yesterday, um, we've identified five things that will really help us move forward as, a, as, as an industry with pace and data to aid us in making our existing fleet more efficient, not just in the way it's designed, but the way it's operated. And clearly CII is, is going to be quite transformative in the fact that for the first time we're going to have two identical ships with two different efficiency ratings, depending on how they're operated. Um, but also, you know, everything that we talked about in terms of energy saving technologies, trying to get real validated, accurate data as to how either wind powered or wind assisted or air lubrication or other energy saving tech, whether it's weather routing, voyage optimization, um, everything that was on Brian's slide and there's lots, there's lots of them, um, I think will re really help us to understand what's working and what's not working and, and try to reach some conclusions with greater pace. Um, that said, 
we don't have a great track record at um, using data for the holistic benefit of, of the industry. And I think we are, as a, as a, as a sector, you know, whether it's um, people that operate the ships or people put the equipment on board the ships, we tend to want to hold on to our own data. And I think um, that in itself is something that we've been talking about for many years and are still struggling to make some progress with. I've seen Paolo from uh, Department for Transport is with us. I need to put his hand off, so if we can hear from Paolo, that would be great. Yeah, thank you very much. So I just want to make three uh, points, and uh, by the way, the presentation was excellent. And uh, on biofuel, uh, building on what Brian mentioned before, there's a wider policy point. So in the uh, RT4, in the Renewable Transport Fuel Obligation Consultation, we explain what is the uh, challenge with biofuels in the maritime sector. So uh, the availability of biomass across the energy system is limited. And since we want to get on a zero as effectively as possible, we need to make sure that we allocate biomass in those sectors with fewer decarbonization options, which, according to the CCC, in uh, the transport sector effectively means aviation, and specifically uh, international aviation, right, where, according to the CCC, 14% of the biomass should be allocated, which, is, which doesn't mean that we are banning biofuels from the shipping sector, just to be very clear, but we considered not supporting biofuel as a marine fuel under the amendment we proposed for the RTFO. On the uh, availability of technologies, I really appreciate the point on the presentation when it's essentially we need to look at which zero emission technologies is more efficient for which sub-segment on the fleet. So government has been talking a lot about the concept of technology neutrality, which is something that we can adopt in a sector, for example, like automotive, where 70 to 80 percent of emissions are cars and vans, and industry has already made a decision that battery technology is the technologies to go, so it is very easy for us to be technology neutral in the road sector, right? In the maritime sector, that is more difficult because, as uh, you all say, there are a lot of technologies that could be perfectly used, even biofuels, because biofuels do reduce emissions, right? So the question is how to be strategic across different subsegments of the fleet, because yes, we do, we are technology agnostic but we are not outcome neutral. We want to get to net zero as quickly and effectively as possible. Right? On uh, pilot projects, uh, so most of you, and I totally agree with that, have talked about the importance of pilot projects to test the technology, essentially to try before you buy, especially if you're talking about infrastructure. Right? So you need to try it, you need to see if it works, for which subsegment of the fleet it works, then you start deployment. Right? Which is why uh, we have announced a clean maritime demonstration competition as part of the 10-point plan. So uh, this, as uh, so you will see tomorrow the winner. So I can't really, uh, uh, I would love to do that, but I can't do it. Right? Uh, but you will see that this is the biggest technology demonstration, so R&D, that has been ever deployed by the Department for Transport in terms of technologies in scope. In terms of participants, and we're talking about, when, when we talk about winners, organization winners, we're talking about hundreds working in partnership with supply chain companies in the automotive and aerospace sector, which also gives a clue about how developed is the clean maritime supply chain in the UK. Right? And considering funding on a one-year basis, also the biggest R&D demonstration competition ever done in the maritime sector, well, across all modes, right? And anyway, the biggest are in the investment in maritime decarbonization in the history of this country. That's it. Great, thank you for that, Paolo. Um, just any final thoughts? Like, what do people in the marine field, does, does what's been presented today chime with your organizations? There's a couple of nods around. Yeah, a thumb, even a thumbs up, great, okay. Um, Okay, so I think that probably brings us to the end of this session. Um, just a huge, huge thank you to everybody in the room, everybody joining us remotely, to Nanda and um, colleagues on the panel, to Brian for his presentation, to the IMA for hosting us. I'd have to say the AV guys as well are amazing. Thank you so much. Um, 
And just in summary then, so just some key thoughts and reflections. I think whenever we're talking about climate change, so I come from international development, I'm not a maritime person, um, although so far you're very lovely, uh, so I'm glad to be in the sector. Um, <laughs> So, but I think what's really important when we're talking about climate change and the, the mission to reduce um, emissions is that it's very easy to focus on the challenge and the problems and the complexity and the barriers and the, the niggly things we're going to have to get through. But I think it's really important to keep in mind this is an absolute unique time to be alive as human beings and we're in a really unbelievably scary and difficult position but we're in a, we are still in a very powerful and incredibly... Uh, rich um, position, full of opportunity. We are the generation that are here now. We can do this. We have to do this. There is no choice anymore, and we've got to get on with it. So I think, um, and wouldn't it be amazing to be the generation that solves this? And can you imagine what it would be like having fleets of ships that do no damage to the environment whatsoever? I mean, that, how incredible would that be that the companies that we're in and the governments that we're part of, we have a maritime sector that is doing nothing but positive things in the world and, and pr protecting the environment and protecting the future for our children and, um, you know, the natural environment as well. So I think, try and think about it in, in, in that sense that we all have our, a really important role to play now and it's a very unique time to be alive. Um, and I think, um, I think what's really encouraging from the discussion as well is there's so many practical positive things we can do. There was a huge range of ideas coming both from uh, participants online, from people in the room and people on the panel. There's a hundred things we can be getting on with. So I think it's, it's time now to end the inertia and there's been a lot of divergence in the sector about should we do this, what about this technology, you know, you, you see bitty articles here and there about different fuel types and I think we know that um, it isn't just about the fuel types, we know it's a systematic problem, and we all are all part of that. So I think the plea here is just do whatever you can in your sector, in your company, in, uh, with colleagues, with partner organisations to take the steps that you can take to test. Well, that's very much what we're trying to do at the MCA, and we know that everybody is as passionate as we are about trying to tackle this problem find, you know, and find the solutions. So I think let's just all try and end that inertia. Um, we know, um, for example, uh, what I think one of the major things that has come from this, that there are energy efficiency options now, there, there's renewable energy, let's absolutely maximise that. We don't need to wait for government incentives necessarily, it would be great if they were there, but let's, let's do whatever we can to move forward with those. We've got things and solutions available now that we can progress with then there, there seems to be a, a good consensus around the fact we need to pilot, we need to test, we need research and development. And again, we need government to help support that, but we also need to, to take responsibility for doing whatever we can to test and, and retrofit and get pilots going and, and collaborations going. So that next point as well is about that collaboration. I think, again, speaking to the uniqueness of the time that we're in and the challenge that we're facing, we kind of do have to put our hats to the side a bit, whether it's our corporate interest or um, our organisational interest, and we've got to step out of that and work really collaboratively together to find the solution. We've agreed here, this is a complex problem, complex range of solutions. We have to work together across sectors, um, uh, across competitive boundaries even, to, to find these solutions. So I'd say let's really just take that home with us as well. Um, Seafarers feel like a really big part of the picture as well, so that feels like something we need to hone in on practically. How do we boost the well-being, boost the skills, boost the training, making sure um, you know the, the human element is, is fit for purpose and future-proof. And again, the infrastructure part seems like a really big... feels like the really big problem, but I think... Um, you know, again, testing, piloting, let's move, let's see, see what the problems are and how we can kind of get under the skin of those. Um, so, yeah, I think, again, this is arguably one of the biggest challenges human beings have ever faced, but um, we, and I know that there is passion out there, we just have to come together, shift priorities, work really collaboratively and, and find, take these steps together forward and start moving, really. I think that's the conclusion from today. So thank you ever so much, everybody. Have a fantastic afternoon. For those in the room, definitely come and talk to us, give us your thoughts and reflections, and um, we at the MCA are very keen to work with you in the future. So, yeah, definitely give us a shout. Thank you ever so much. Thank you.